Hey, if you guys would, turn in your Bibles right now. I want you to turn to two places. Turn to Genesis 6, mark your place there, and then make your way to Hebrews chapter 11. Genesis 6, mark your place there, and then Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to do something a little different tonight. I'm excited about it after the study. We're going to do a little panel discussion. I've got some guys who um, are going to just kind of get up front here and answer some questions. And I have some questions for them. And maybe we'll even, if time permits, uh, see if you guys have any questions for them as well. But it'll pertain to what we're going to talk about tonight. So um, Hebrews chapter 11, this is week four of our Men of Faith series. And tonight we're talking about, we're looking at Noah. So we read in verse um, seven of Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Noah and his example to us of a man of faith. And Lord, as we consider tonight, Noah was a last days believer, living in the last days before you flooded the earth. And Lord, we, we believe that we are living in the last days. And so Lord, I pray that you would teach us from Noah tonight about what it means to be last days believers. I pray for these men, I thank you for these brothers and Lord, I just ask that you would meet each one of us here tonight in a special way. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I've got a question for you. How many of you believe, show of hands, how many of you believe that we are living in a world right now that is pretty messed up? How many of you think that? Okay, I think all of you. Um, how many of you think that this, is, this world that we're living in is a pretty evil place? Okay, pretty anti-God place, yes, okay. Um, do you realize that the current state of our world, I want you to think about this, the current state of our world is nowhere as bad as it was in Noah's day. Think about that. But the world in Noah's day, I want you to think about this, it was so bad so anti-God, so rebellious that God determined that the entire earth and everyone on it needed to be destroyed. That there was only one man and his family that were worth saving. That's heavy. I want you to ponder that for a moment. Especially those of us who are, are prone to complain a lot about how bad our world is. And I'm not diminishing that it's bad. It is. But nowhere near, not even close to the day and age in which Noah was living in. Noah was a last day's believer. He was awaiting the flood that was going to come upon planet Earth. We also are last day's believers. We're awaiting the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, with that in mind, keep your place here in Hebrews 11 because we're going to come back to it. But I want us to turn to Genesis 6 to get some background on what was going on in Noah's time. So Genesis chapter 6, I want to draw your attention to verse 5. Genesis 6 verse 5. It says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No good. Only evil. That's pretty dark. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now, pause right there for a minute. Give me your attention. When it says that God was sorry that he made man, that does not suggest that God was thinking that he made a mistake. That's, that's not the context here. 
God's not regretting his decision in the sense of like, oh, I blew it on that one. You see, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. And we read back in Genesis chapter 1 that on the sixth day, it'll be on the screen, that God made man and he made them male and female and he gave them dominion over the earth and over the animals. And then it tells us in Genesis 1 verse 31 that on the sixth day, then God saw everything that he made and indeed it was very good. So God makes everything. He makes man. He makes Adam and Eve. And and he's looking at everything after six days of creating. And he's like, it's good. This is good. And we must not forget that when God made man, he knew. He knew when he made man. He knew full well that man was going to rebel. Now that's hard for us to understand, isn't it? It's like, why? Why would God do that? That's a head scratcher for me. That's one of those things that, that when we get to heaven, I think we're going to fully, it's like, like, it's, it's like Paul said, right now we see through a glass dimly and then we're going to see clearly. This is one of those things where it's like, we, none of us would do this, but God did. God made man knowing full well that man was going to rebel. And knowing full well that in order to save man, Jesus was going to have to come. That he was going to have to send his only begotten son. And Revelation 13 verse 8 tells us that Jesus was the lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. So God knew before he even created man what was going to take place. So prior to the fall, God looks at his creation, including man, and he's pleased. He's like, it's good, but he knows what is coming. He knows man is going to rebel. He knows man is going to break his heart because God is omniscient. He knows all things. There are never any surprises with God. We get surprised all the time with things. God's never surprised. He's never caught off guard. He's never in heaven going like, how in the world did that happen? Can somebody tell me? You know, no. He knows. He sees. He's he's omniscient. You know, sometimes in a very, very different way, I experienced this this with my grandson, Josiah. Very different from, I'm not omniscient. But there are so many times, Josiah is seven, And there's so many times with that little guy that my heart, when I'm with him, is just full of so much joy, so much praise, so much happiness. I look at him and I see this as he's a beautiful little kid. I mean, he's so, so handsome, beautiful eyes. I mean, he's just a really, really sharp looking guy. He's smart, he's athletic, he's kind, he's compassionate. So I look at him sometimes and I'm just like, gosh, I love this kid, man. He is just so amazing. He's such a great little boy. But then my heart can get sad because I know what's coming. I know that there's a rebellious stage that's coming. I know that at some point, should the Lord tarry, that little guy is going to break my heart. He's going to break my heart. Because you see, I see the sin nature in him. It's strong, just like in us. And I see it. I see when he, you know, can have his little moments and, and, I, and I pray for him. But I know he's going to go through, at some point in time, a rebellious stage. How do you know that, Pastor Rob? Because all three of my kids (laughs) did. (laughs) They all had their moments. And so did I. And so did you. So I know that that it's coming. Because that's the world that we live in. My prayer is that when it comes, it just won't last very long. And it won't be too heartbreaking but I know it's coming so God is looking at his creation in Genesis chapter 1 
pre the fall and he's pleased, but he knows what is coming because he knows all things. He sees all things. And then in Genesis 6, we read that he's sorry that he even made man. And what Genesis 6 is doing, it's letting us in on the reality that God has emotions, that God can be grieved and that God can be angered. So in Genesis 1, he's pleased with what he made. And after thousands of years, we come to Genesis chapter 6, and God has grieving, listen, at what man has done with his world. God is grieving over what man has done with what he has given him. And again, Genesis 6 is letting us in on the emotional heart of God and how sin grieves him. Now, the effects of sin are so deep and so bad that God decides to start over. Look at verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. I like what Ray Pritchard said. It should be on the screen. Um, Pastor Ray said this. So now God decides to uncreate the earth. Think of what this means. Whole cities destroyed, homes washed away, roads covered, buildings inundated, inundated, whole villages flooded, men, women, children vanishing beneath the waves. The whole earth under the waters of judgment. Nothing like it has happened before and nothing like it has happened since. It was a catastrophic judgment that enveloped the entire globe and washed away every visage of human civilization. It's heavy. It's heavy. But then look at verse 8. In verse 8 we read, but Noah. Can I encourage you in your Bible reading, pay attention to the buts. The buts that are in the Bible. Because they're always a signal to something. And here, God's laying out like this horrible, horrible thing. But then he says, but Noah. My favorite but in the Bible is found in Ephesians chapter 2 when God is laying out, you know, just the depravity of man. Just how, how wicked we were and just going our own way and just, stray, uh, just going astray and wandering and aimlessly seeking to please ourselves. And it just lays this little picture out of just the depravity of man. But then it says, but God. But God, when we were at our worst, God is always at his best. And here we see, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is one of the greatest contrasts in the Bible. This passage is a great illustration of Romans 5.20 that says, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And had not God orchestrated a great turnaround, none of us would even be here right now. Noah, it says, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace means undeserved favor. So why was it undeserved? Because Noah was a sinner, just like everybody else. Just like you and I. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Noah was also a man in his heart who was following God. And perhaps, it seems, he was the only one, the only one on planet Earth who was really following God. And so God shows him grace, undeserved favor, and says, hey, you and your family, you're going to survive. I like what Matthew Henry in his commentary said, God looks down upon those with an eye of favor who sincerely look up to him with an eye of faith. Isn't that good? And let's be those who are looking up to God. So Noah received grace from God and he received a mission from God that it would take faith to walk it out. So with that in mind and with that as a background, let's turn back to Hebrews chapter 11 and I want us to note four things tonight about Noah's faith. Hebrews chapter 11 If you're taking notes, the first thing that I want you to note tonight about Noah's faith is that Noah walked by faith believing in the word of God. His faith was based upon God's word, what God had said. 
God came to Noah and gave him a promise. He said, I am going to flood the earth with water and water is going to come down out of the sky and cover the earth. Now, note this. Noah lived at a time when th there was this water canopy that covered the earth. It had never rained. It had never rained. All the water came up from the ground. It came up from, from the dew. So it, it hadn't rained. It was very, very tropical. And Noah said, hears from God, I'm going to bring water out of the sky. And, and Noah doesn't question that. He's not like, oh, how's that going to happen? No, it says, by faith, look at verse 7, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. He'd never seen rain. He'd never seen water come out of the sky. He'd never seen a flood before, but God said it and Noah believed it and that settled it. And so here's what I want you to catch, men. Noah began living his life. Catch this. He began living his life for an event that was to happen in the future. That's what faith is. He began living his life for an event that was going to happen in the future. 120 years in the future. <laughs> Think about that. That's how long it took Noah to build the ark. Noah, though, lived his life believing that that was going to be a reality. His life was marked by a faith in the word of God, in what God had said. What's the application for us? Well, Jesus made a promise to us. In John chapter 14, Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, if you were with us in our study of the book of Revelation, we noted that, that this verse, John chapter 14, Jesus is talking about the rapture. He's saying, I'm going to my father's house. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back again to do what? To take you, to receive you to this place that I've been preparing. That's the promise that we have from Jesus, that Jesus is coming. He's preparing a place for us. He's going to take us to heaven. My question for you is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? And if you do, the second question is, are you living your life in the reality that Jesus could come at any moment? Are you living with that reality? Are your priorities, are our lives, are our choices marked by a reality that we believe that Jesus could come at any moment? You know, the early church, they believed, they lived with a mentality that the return of Jesus was imminent. I think that's one of the reasons why they were so powerful. It was said of the early church that they were not looking for a cleft in the ground called the grave. In other words, they weren't looking to die, but a clearing in the sky called glory. They were not watching for the undertaker, but for the upper taker. Joseph Stoll in one of his books said this. He's encouraging, in this book, he was encouraging us to be not earthbound believers, but heavenbound believers, people who know where, where their home is. And he says, when we are consumed with the reality of heaven, Christ is free to consume us on earth. When we realize that our final gain is th there and then, we are free to live for him here and now. When heaven is the transcendent target of our living, then we indeed have the best of both worlds, Christ here and gain there. I love that. It was C.S. Lewis who said, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in too. But if you aim at earth, you'll get neither. So Noah, first of all, walked by faith, believing in the word of God. The second thing we see about his faith is that he was moved with godly fear. Look at verse seven again. He says, by faith, being divinely warned of things not seen, moved with godly fear. The Bible declares that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But it also says that the fear of man is a snare. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the fear of God? It's not a fear of, you know, I'm afraid that God's going to, you know, bang me over the head if I step out of line. 
That he's just, you know, up there with a big stick waiting for you to step out of line. Or, or that God's going to, you know, make your car get a flat tire if you do something that you shouldn't. Or you're going to make you get in a really bad car accident. That's not the God who is your father. That's not what he does. That was, that's what the Godfather does. You know, that's not what the God who is your father does, all right? That's not how he works. The fear of God is not like a, a sense of, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid of God. I don't want to go even near him. But it's more of a, a deep respect, a reverence. It's an utter dread because you love him so much that you don't want to do anything that would cause him grief. That's what the Bible's talking about when it says walking in the fear of God. It's a reverence that, that God is awesome. That he's powerful. Yes, the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of, of the living God. But that's speaking of the rebellious. It's not speaking of God's children. You know, it's just like you as fathers. You don't want, you, you want your kids to respect you. You want your kids to know that, you know, if, if they uh, do something, there's consequences to doing something wrong. But you don't want them walking on eggshells all the time and feeling like they can't draw near to you and they don't want to get close to you because they just feel like my dad's going to fly off the handle. That's not God. No, God's a loving father. But we respect him. We reverence him. It, it, I Think of it this way. The fear of God to me is sort of like the ocean. You know, you can go into the ocean um, you know, we live here by the beach and you can go body surf or go catch waves, but you better have a healthy respect of the ocean because if there's a riptide or if the surf's too big, it can be really, really catastrophic for you. But if you recognize it, it can be a lot of fun. It can be refreshing. You can have a great time. And I think in a similar way, that's how, how we approach God with this reverence and respect, knowing what he's capable of, but also knowing that he just wants us to enjoy him and to be near him. Him. So it's not because I'm afraid of retribution from him. And here's the thing. So fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of man is a snare. And in any given situation, we are going to be led and motivated by one of those two things. Either the fear of man or the fear of God. When we are being motivated by the fear of God, we pause to ask this type of question. What is the Lord going to think about this? What is God's heart on this? This decision that I'm about to make, how does it line up with his word? How does it line up with his will? How does it, how does it line up with his heart? That's walking in the fear of God. It's being concerned about what, what does God think? What's God's heart on this matter? And listen, the more you learn to ask those type of questions, the more spirit-led and the more spirit-filled you will become. You'll be concerned about his heart, his will, his way, his name above everything. But when you are being motivated and moved by the fear of man, you're, you're asking a different question. You're asking, what are people going to think of me? What are, what, are the, what are the guys going to think? What, what, are, what are these people at work going to think if I, if I do this or if I don't do that? What are my family, my friends, my, my co-workers? And to live that way always results in a snare. It'll trap you up. And one of the reasons is because the line and the standards are always constantly moving. And so when you're trying to please men, it never ends. It just keeps moving and keeps moving and it keeps moving and you keep going further and further. It traps you. It ensnares you. And that's what the devil loves to see happen. I mean, think about it tonight. Ball game's going on. If one of the Padres hits a home run tonight to win the game, he's what? He's the hero, right? Now, tomorrow, if he strikes out with the bases loaded to lose the game... <laughs> <laughs> then everybody hates him. You know, that's the way it works. That's how it is in this life. That, that man is never, ever satisfied. Noah moved with godly fear. He wasn't worried about what people thought of him. And so because of that, Noah was a man who could go against the grain. He could swim against the tide. We need men today who are willing and ready to go against the grain. 
Men who are ready to swim against the tide, swim upstream. Noah lived in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, but he loved God. Noah lived at a time when, when it was unpopular to walk with God and to stand for the Lord, but Noah was faithful. You know, it's easy to be a Christian when Christianity is in fashion, when it's popular. You know, I, I got saved in, in sort of the tail end or maybe actually more like the middle of the Jesus people movement. God was moving, and it was popular to be a Christian. It was popular. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to the concert at Calvary Costa Mesa. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing, you know, and and, and there would be thousands of young people there. It was popular. It was the in thing. It was cool. Not so much today, is it? It's not the popular thing to be a Christian. It's harder today. And so we need to be men like Noah who are walking in the fear of God, not the fear of man. The third thing that Noah's faith led him to do was to take care of his family. Look at verse 7 again. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah's faith is seen Throughout his story, he believed the word of God and he acted upon it. But I'm, I'm, I'm especially intrigued by the phrase, by faith Noah built the ark for the saving of his household. Here's what's interesting about this. And you can examine this on your own. If you study the genealogies in Genesis chapter 5, This is what you will find is Noah began building on the ark. He began constructing the ark before his sons were even born. Isn't that interesting to think about? You see, they were born when Noah was around 500 years old. He got a real late start. (laughs) And the ark was completed when he was 600 years old. And we know the Bible says it took 120 years to build the ark. So that means he started it when he was 480 years old. Before his kids were even born. Think about that. He's building this boat and he made room for his sons and their wives and and their kids before it was even born. Before they were even born. By faith, Noah was planning ahead. His family was the only family that was saved on the ark. And I think this is a great testimony. That Noah took care of his family while living in wicked times. Guys, we are called to take care of our families. While we're living in wicked times. And I don't know how many of you still have kids at home or little ones or, you know, or, or how many of you guys are, are married and have a wife that, that you're taking care of. But, but guys, we are called to take care of our families, to lead our families, to be servant leaders for our families. For all of us here who, who have um, grandkids, we're called Guys, I want you to view that. Especially if they can be somehow a part of your life. I want to encourage you to view that as a privilege that God has given you. I'll be honest with you. I've I've kind of shared this before, but my my daughter Amy, my oldest daughter, my second uh, child, um, she went through a really... Um, bad divorce just after Josiah turned one. And they quickly moved into our house and lived with us for the next four years. My wife and I had eight months of being empty nesters. And it was glorious. (laughs) We loved it. It was amazing. And then they moved in. And I'll be honest with you, because I'm naturally a selfish guy. I, I, I love my daughter. I love my grandson. 
But I wasn't digging it. I was like, Lord, I don't like this, you know? Lord, you know, I want to just, me and Denise, you know? It's like, come on, we already did this. We already raised these kids, you know, kind of thing. And I went to the men's conference. I think it was two years ago up in Anaheim, the one that's coming up. That If you haven't signed up for it, there's still spaces. I encourage you, uh, get on the bus and, uh, to go. It's going to be a great, great conference. And Al Pittman, guy out of Colorado, was teaching. And, and he gave a charge to all the grandpas to see that their opportunity, that see that, that those, those grandkids in their life were God's opportunity, God's privilege that they was giving to, to them. And, and it was like a knife stuck my heart. And I was like, oh, changed my whole attitude. And I started just realizing, okay, I'm in Josiah's life right now for a reason. He was over our house today after school, and every time he sees me right now, and I love this, is, is he comes up to me and he, he, he tells me that he loves me. <laughs> tells me that he loves me, and then he says, he prays for my shoulder. I asked him one time, he would pray for my shoulder. Every time he sees me now, because if you weren't here Sunday, I, I tore my rotator cuff, so my shoulder's kind of messed up. That's so why if you ever see me lift this arm too much and I kind of grimace, that's why, <laughs> because it really hurts. Um, but anyway, he prays for me. Like, like, just, I love that. Like, he just has that in his heart. Like, Lord, please heal Poppy's shoulder. I love it. Guys, it's our privilege to pour into those grandkids that God's called us. Noah, Noah locked in. His kids aren't even born yet. And he's like preparing things for them. And if you have kids that are in the house, we can't just be content that they come to church. Guys, we need to train them. We need to pour into them. They need to know what God's word says and they need to know why. They don't, you just don't want your kids to be like, well, God, you know, why, why are you saying it? Because God said not to do it. No, you need to tell them why. They need to understand the heart behind what God said. So Noah he took care of his family. The fourth and final thing I want to consider tonight about Noah isn't in our text here, but it's found in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And it tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't just a builder, he was a preacher. So for 120 years, as he's building that boat, he's calling on people to turn from their sin. Calling on people. Think about that. 120 years. There's, there's, there's a flood coming, water's coming out of the sky, and, and you need to repent. Think about that. Imagine how crazy Noah must have seemed to his world. I mean, when he starts gathering wood and supplies and, and as the construction starts, pretty soon people are seeing like he's building something. They're, they're coming by, hey, Noah, what are you building? And, and, and as they, they're seeing like it's big, it's enormous what, what he's building. And you know, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. Why? Because God's going to bring water out of the sky and he's going to flood the earth. And whoever's not on this boat is going to perish. And people just, they're laughing at him. I can picture that, that for a while, maybe a few years, it's like he's the Saturday afternoon activity. Like, hey, family, what do you want to do? Let's go make fun of Noah, you know? And everybody's going down and like they're, they're teasing him and, you know, that type of thing. But after a while, it's like he's just the crazy oddball guy, you know, that people are cruising by his house and he's got this enormous boat he's building out there. People asking, you know, think about that. Why are you building it so big? And he says, well, God's going to bring all the animals. <laughs> I mean, how crazy, right? You know, I mean, think about this. Think about the faith that this took for Noah to do this, to, to answer the call of God and, and re realizing how ridiculous it sounded. The whole thing just sounds preposterous. Water's going to come out of the sky. That's never happened before. God's going to bring all the animals two by two onto the ark so that you know, they can be preserved. Like, like, are you kidding me? But he did it. He did it. He was a preacher of righteousness. The whole time he's preaching. But no one's listening. Think about that. 
I'll let you in on a little, little secret. So, if you were here Sunday second service, we had a neat time. Some people came forward, gave their lives to the Lord, and I don't do that all the time. And I'll tell you, every single time I do an altar call, I am scared to death that no one's going to respond. And it's just awkward, you know? It's just awkward, you know? So I battle it. I fight it like every single time. Imagine Noah, 120 years, not a single hand goes up, not a single altar call, not a single person responds. He's faithful. He's just faithful to share. And guys, that's what God's calling us to do is to be faithful, He's calling us to also be preachers of righteousness. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 3, who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them or be intimidated. So if you're being persecuted, people making fun of you, don't fear them, don't be intimidated. But in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, and then catch this part, and be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. That's our calling. But guys, here's what I want you to think about tonight. In order for that to happen, in order for anybody to ever ask you, To say, hey, Glenn, what's the reason for the hope that is in you? Hey, Vern, what's the reason for the hope that is in you? Those people have to know you and see you and be around you. No, a stranger is not going to come up to you and go, you look really happy. What's the reason for the hope that is in you? But when the world's going to pieces... And people that you are around and rubbing shoulders with and getting to know and having lunch with and, you know, working alongside of and, 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 and that sort of thing. And they see, man, everybody seems like they're freaking out and you're not freaking out. I want to know why. That's how it happens. You get to know people. So the Bible calls being salt and light. And what that means, guys, is we can't go live in our own little bubbles, God calls me in the world, but not of the world. And a lot of Christians, they, they want to be completely out of the world. They want to isolate themselves. They, they, they want to be, you know, in, in, in their little Christian communes. And, and you know, I want to have my Christian gym and my Christian friends and my Christian coffee shop. And I go to my Christian church and I, my kids go to a Christian school and we never interact with the unbelievers. That's not what God's called us to do at all. Our flesh likes that. No, he wants us to be in the world. And I'll tell you, the, the hardest thing about being a pastor, I'll be honest with you, this is the thing I, I miss the most is getting to rub shoulders every single day with people that I worked with that weren't Christians. I, have, I work with people here at the church sometimes that don't act like Christians, but they are Christians, you know? But, but I miss being out there with people who aren't Christians. So I have to work really, really hard to try to build relationships with neighbors and the guy at the coffee shop or the guy at the gym. I gotta, I gotta work extra hard. Some of you, you're, it's with you every day. I miss that. I miss that. God's called us to be salt and light. And that's the only way that anybody's ever gonna ask you about the Lord, about your hope. So we learn this about the faith of Noah. His faith was based on the word. He moved with godly fear. He took care of his household, his family. He was a preacher of righteousness. But I also want you to know this. Noah wasn't a perfect guy. None of these guys in the hall of faith were perfect guys. They were all sinners. They all had flaws. And in Noah's case, we read after flood, he gets drunk. He exposes himself. God isn't calling us to be perfect, just faithful. He's just calling us to be stewards, to be faithful to what he has given to you. What tasks, what opportunities, what what are the things that he's put before you, your family, people you work with, opportunities to serve him. He's just saying, hey, I'm making you a steward of all of that and I just want you to be faithful. And I'll close with this, this reminder. 
You know, God's commandments to us are also his enablements. And I love that story in Mark's gospel. I think it's chapter two. Jesus is in a synagogue and there's a man there with a withered hand. That means his hand's shriveled up and he can't, he can't stretch out his arm because it's all shriveled. And Jesus sees him. He has compassion on him. And he says to the guy, now think about this. He doesn't say, touch him and say, be healed. He says, stretch out your hand. That guy could sit there and go, what are you talking about? Don't you see? I can't stretch out my hand. But God's commandments are God's enablements. And that guy believed. He believed in the power that Jesus had. And so he, Jesus says to stretch out my hand. I've never been able to do this since it's been shriveled up, but I'm going to stretch out my hand. And as he took that step of faith as he walked in obedience God met him and his power was unleashed and his he was able to stretch out his hand I say that because this is what we do a lot of times God tells us to love our wives and we say okay God change my heart change my heart toward her you know Lord I've been really kind of angry at with her and Lord change my heart and then I'll, I'll love her and he says no you you love her and then I'll change your heart you obey me and then you'll see. You watch and see what happens. That's how it works. And I'm so glad that when we do fail, and I, and I want to leave you with this tonight, back to this, because it all goes back to the, what we read in Genesis, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All of us every single day can find grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God wants us to know this, exactly what he told Paul when he said this. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Guys, we've been sold a, a wrong bill of goods by culture that, that teaches us that as men, we've got to be strong and we've got to have it all together. And we grow up believing that. We grow up thinking that. We strive for that. And God says, no, that's not the way it works. At least it's not the way it works in living for me and walking with me. Your strength is going to be found in your weakness, in, your re, in the reality, in, in your understanding that, hey, I can't do this. That's one of the best things you can tell God. Lord, I can't do this. I can't, but I know you can't through me. And so I'm gonna take steps of faith to do what you're telling me to do, believing that your grace is sufficient and your power is gonna be made perfect in my weakness. Amen? Amen. So first off, I'm going to have uh, these guys kind of introduce themselves so you kind of get to know them a little bit and just who they are. So you are? James Kopitsky. And uh, James, what do you do? I'm in biotech, in the biotech industry. I'm a consultant in the sales side. So I manage a region in Southern California and Hawaii. Okay. So you don't work for a Christian company? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, married? Yes. How many kids and how old? Um, I have four kids total, two from my previous marriage, okay. and I have two with my current wife who I've been married to for 18 years. Okay. And how old are they, the, the kids? Um, they are 12, 14, 22, and almost 25. Okay. 12, 14? Yeah. Okay, so a couple little ones and then some older ones, and, and so you've been divorced. I have been divorced. Okay, so yep. we don't hold that against him. Um, God's <laughs> grace. Uh, God is good. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, good. And you are? Sean McCrary. You taught last week, huh? I did teach I, last week. I heard week. it was good. Did, yeah. you, did you guys hear Sean? Was it good last week? Awesome. Good, good. Thank you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Sean, what do you do? Um, I also work at a biotech, um, <laughs> uh, the world's largest biotech, so not a godly place. But um, uh, I do supply chain data analytics. Okay. So that means you're really smart. I pretend, yes. Yeah. Um, and how many uh, kids do you have? I have two kids. Uh, my daughter's 15, and my son is just turning 11. 11. 
Yeah. And how long have you been married? 21 years. 21 years. We were high school sweethearts. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. High school sweethearts. Yeah, I proposed. Uh, we had like about in college, we had known we were going to get married. So my wife said, in order for you to get me to say yes, you need to do something cool. Like we need to have a blimp or something <laughs> like that. And so in a restaurant on Valentine's, it was really corny. I had a blimp, one of those stadium blimps, fly into the restaurant, and it said, like, Kristen, will you marry me? And so she said yes. I thought you were going to say, like, you proposed in the lunch line. And yeah. I said, <laughs> no, no. Uh, all right. And on the end. My name is Jamie Urbina. Okay. And what do you do? I work for a home builder, national home builder, uh, managing on the land development side, married for 20 years to my beautiful wife, Rachel, who I met right here in this church. We have two boys. Uh, Wesley is 18, and Shepard is 13. All right, yeah. cool. So James and Sean are a lot smarter than Jamie and I. But <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, okay, good. So none of you guys work for Christian Company. So you guys are around unbelievers. All right. So um, let, let's talk about uh, tonight. And uh, the first thing we mentioned tonight was that Noah walked by faith, believing in the word of God. And so as, as I think about that, I think in order to really be a man of the word, um, you need to be in the word. Okay. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You know, you got to be in the word. And so... Um, I have a question for you guys, just each of you. What's your devotional life look like? You want to start, James? So my devotional life, um, I think, well, what I want to say is it starts with an intention. And for me, I have to be very intentional about doing that. I think it's important that I do that because it really sets a solid foundation for what I'm doing day in and day out. Um, I'm intentional to get in the Word every single morning. I wake up, have a cup of coffee, and I get in the Word and um, start my day that way. Um, I think part of my devotional life also is what I listen to throughout the day. I do a lot of driving. When I'm driving, I listen to a lot of worship music. Um, I personally don't do well listening to music that I used to listen to because it takes me mentally to places that I used to go that I don't want, and I don't want to go there. It's not worth it to me. And so um, I read a lot of books too. I like to read um, when I have time. <laughs> don't always have a lot of time, but so, I mean, I think the core of my devo devotional life is that. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, and uh, are you working through like any particular book of the Bible right now or? Um, so I'm doing the Bible in chronological order, okay. the, the, the yearly Bible. So, so right now I'm in, I, well, I just got in the New Testament. So it's <laughs> Matthew, Matt, so, so it's like Matthew, Luke, and John. I just, yeah. So, okay. so, so just kind of jumping around depending on, you know. The, so is it like the one-year Bible, but chronological? Is that yeah. What it is? Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So, all right, cool. Um, what about you, Sean? What's your devos look like? Um, exactly like yeah. James. <laughs> Uh, it is going to sound a little bit repetitive, um, but I do want to highlight. So mine, I think the most power I found in just being able to be consistent and feeling that, that continual growth is from that morning cup of coffee with the Bible. And so I've, my wife and I, uh, we get up before the kids and, uh, you know, pour the cup of coffee. And then for that next 30 minutes to an hour before the kids wake up, we're reading. And it's, for me, it's actually works perfectly. And this is kind of maybe an encouragement to you. You're how God made you and structured you. Like if you're a morning riser and you need to go do something, or if you're a very slow wake up person like me, it works perfectly that that's the time I'm reading. That's the time I'm slowly waking up because it's waking up with the Lord. So it, it partners well. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the rest of the day, uh, actually, again, echo, I, I, feed my, the periphery of this foundation that's laid every morning with kind of these more like broader thoughts on, you know, different uh, audiobooks. I don't read as much. I love to say I could read, but I always go, well, when do you have time to read? Like, <laughs> so 
That, that's where I'm at. The foundation is the basic uh, word in the morning. Mm. Okay. Well, you, Jamie. Uh, so I think mine would be more defined by some characteristics throughout my uh, walk with Jesus. And I, I would say that my devotional life is and has been challenging, uh, abstract, but beautiful. Hmm. And I loved, you know, a common denominator I, I think I heard, you know, as these guys share. Coffee. <laughs> was coffee. <laughs> but uh, it was discipline, you know. I yeah. think uh, it's kind of a root of disciple. And I think as, as I've grown, um, of course, with age, but uh, in my walk with Jesus, I think I have learned how to be disciplined, especially in this area, because this is some, something uh, in, in terms of a characteristic and trait of a believer that is dynamic and will affect and change our lives inside and out. And, and I've seen it happen. I think there's nothing more motivating, you know, when watching the Lord work and move, especially through our time in his word, you really get so much more of a sense of, you know, how God's word is just interwoven in our lives, mm. you know, like a tapestry. But, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm mm, preaching. Sorry. But my, right now, I'm in a new season of life. Um, I used to be able to wake up, you know, have a cup of coffee and sit on the couch and, you know, watch my children play and, and, and you know, have this peaceful moment. And I'm totally joking with these guys, but, but it's not. It's like wake up early and I'm out the door. And even when I'm at work, it's like go, go, go. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of uh, been a challenge for me lately to find, you know, consistency. And, and I, as much as intention as I'm throwing at it, um, you know, it looks a little different. And I have to be okay with that because God is so faithful. And I, and I love even kind of what we're talking about, like, in my weakness, God has shown his strength, even in the times that I do spend in his word and, uh, and the little nuggets that he gives me, even when, if, if I'm in a conversation with my wife or, mm. you know, one of my friends. So I, I know it might sound like I'm piecemealing right now, but, but um, sometimes that's how it is. Mm. That's the reality, you know? And of course, we have the enemy who's trying to keep us away from, from God's word and that consistent uh, discipline but, uh, you know, I'm here to fight. So, yeah. That's good. You know, for me, I, um, I, I agree with what they're saying, that discipline's key. Got to discipline ourselves to be, you know, men of the word. Um, my devotional life, though, constantly changes. And, uh, and what I mean by that, it'll change, um, you know, for one season, I might be doing a one-year Bible kind of a thing. Another season, I might be working through uh, a book of just one book of the Bible, and kind of just really going deep into it, meditating upon it, and I and I sort of change up what I'm doing based upon when I hit sort of a dry time, and then it's like it's kind of signaled to me like, okay, I'm going to change this up. I might battle through it for a little bit, but then I'll change it up. And so right now, I'm actually doing more of like a a word study type of a um, devotional. And um, I've been really kind of zeroing in and focusing on the word, the, the word faith and um, just kind of doing a lot of digging into, you know, that. And I, here, here's how I read. My, my devotional life isn't so much, um, cons- I'm not so much concerned about the quantity of it, like how long it is, but the quality of it. And I basically, I will read for as long as I have time. Like if I, if I have somewhere I need to, to be, like tomorrow, I have a very early meeting tomorrow. Um, but if I, I will read for as long uh, until God speaks to me. So sometimes God speaks to me in five minutes. It's like he, I, I get, you know, I get some. He touches my heart. I love to journal, so I journal. I write things down in a in an app that I have on my iPad called Evernote, and I keep that. So I, I'm a meditator, so I like to meditate on that through the day. 
Um, but sometimes it's like five minutes. God speaks to me, and I'm like, oh, man, this is great. And it's like, touch my heart. I'm praying. I might go for a walk and, and pray. Um, and then I'm on. It's like, okay, I'm going to get to work now, you know, and uh, get on with my day. Or maybe I'll go do a workout because I, you know, God spoke to me early. <laughs> you know, and other days, other times it might be 30 minutes. It might be an hour if I have, you know, an hour where I'm kind of more fighting through something. But the point of it is, is I'm just wanting to commune with him. And, you know, wanting him, I just want to have a moment, you know, with him to carry me through the day that I can meditate on. And uh, what, what I find is sometimes um, that comes in short chunks rather than big, big huge chunks. Because um, that's the way my brain works is like I just need to kind of focus on one thing versus a whole bunch of things. So, um, so that's how mine, you know, works. But just, you know, really try to do the the daily um, thing as well, first thing um, in the morning, because I don't know if you guys go through this, but if I, if I try to push it off or I think, oh, I'll get to it later, it never happens. Yeah. never happens. So try to start the day first thing off with the Lord. Um, here's kind of a follow-up question to that. You know, we talked about Noah. He was living, believing the word living for an event that was yet future. Um, I think that's really hard for men to do, to live with the future in view. Any thoughts from any of you guys on why that is? I'll go. Um, because we live today, right? <laughs> like you have your kids asking you for stuff now. You have your bills you have to pay now. You have responsibilities that you could even argue God gave you that you have to do now. And so as men, we're constantly rising up to the occasion of now and doing what we need to do now. We're men of action, we tend to do. And so it's very easy for us to get caught in now and focus in this narrow window of time that we just progress through life without really having an aim, no vision, we just go. But God's calling us to a great vision. He's calling us to a home. He's calling us to a kingdom. And having that vision, even when you're dealing with your day-to-day, -day, your now, allows you to orient to true north in each of those mm -hmm. moments, right? It, because without that vision, you could get turned aside. You can go to the right. You can go to the left. Because you're making a decision for an important decision for that moment to take care of your family, to take care of... So I think it's really easy to lose sight of that future point because the only thing you see right is your right now. Yeah, I've heard some of you say, today is so daily. <laughs> you know? um, any other thoughts, though, on why that's a, a struggle? I think it's particularly a struggle for, for men. I, I think wives sometimes, especially if they're having a hard time with their husbands. They long for heaven. They long to be married to Jesus, you know? <laughs> so they think about a lot more than maybe we yeah. do. But. I think it's obvious, but uh, there's so much to distract us, Yeah, you know? And, and I think uh, that principle probably increases with each year that passes, you know, if it's technology or, uh, you know, or age. But um, it, it definitely is a fight, to stay focused, and I think that's you know kind of even one of uh, the key you know points of of going back to what we first talked about. Why it's so important to stay you know connected to God's word. And you know, I remember um, I can't remember who uh, taught this message, but it was one about spiritual rhythms and mm. looking at the Jewish calendar and you know how God had implemented all of these. Uh, celebrations and festivals and um, and sacrifices that that the people would constantly be reminded they would constantly be put in front of and 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 made to kind of focus on the future mm. and I think that's something that we is lost in our day and age you know in our Western civilization but it's no excuse and so yeah, kind of going back to what we, we start out with, why it's so important that we are connected, you know, to God's word and we're feasting on it, you know, daily. I don't have a lot to add. You guys kind of stole everything I was going to say. So. <laughs> that's why. But, yeah, I know. That's why it, it, 
that's fair. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, we do live in a society of instant gratification. We do, like you kind of mentioned mm -hmm. electronics and like the way the world's going, we can get everything at our fingertips. And so we're so focused on not even tomorrow, but today, this minute, this hour, we got Amazon Prime that does same day shipping, like all these different things, right? And so we're, it's, we're becoming more and more accustomed to that. And so I think future planning, the idea of that gets further and further away mm -hmm. from our mind and that's where the world is taking us. Um, I do just, I mean, going back to the first question again, and I think the importance of having a daily devotion and really for, for, for me personally, starting my day off with my focus vertically, it does help you reach out on that horizontal plane also, but it keeps your focus. For me, it helps me keep my focus um, on the Lord and on my family. And um, it, I mean, always, like we say it, like with a group of guys, like it's armoring up every single day. It's putting mm -hmm. on that armor and really positioning ourselves, but you're positioning your body, your soul and your mind for, you know, the battle that the enemy is going to throw at you. And so, you know, it just, it, it, it keeps that focus on the future and on heaven and on the Lord and, and, and what he has for you opposed to, you know, yeah. the daily stuff. So. I, I like the way Sean put it as far as, uh, I mean, that was, that was really good, James, but I like the way the true north. And I think the, the consistency in the word and then just the reminders throughout the day, it's like just coming and getting recentered again. And I don't know about you, but I, I just need to, to do that constantly to, to, to fight this tension and this pull between those two things. Um, the second thing we saw about Noah was he moved with godly fear. So he was walking in the fear of the Lord. And, and I feel like this is something that is sort of lost today in the church, that there are so many believers today that I just think have no concept of what it means to walk in the fear of God. And, you know, we see so much carnality in the church and even among pastors and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And so I just would love to get your guys' thoughts on, you know, what, why you think that it is such a problem. Well, I know this might sound harsh, and, and I would even put myself in this camp, but I, I think it, it might even start with ignorance, you know, in, in that we're, we're not pursuing to, to know that more, you know? I mean, I, I think even when um, the first time I heard that, I didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder if even that's a concept that we as men have at the forefront of our minds, yeah. you know? that we are walking in the fear of God like Noah did and really what that entails because it really is tied to walking in faith mm. and, and combating all of the things that around us, whether if it is distraction or it is what we're going to be talking about, the fear of man. So, yeah, I, I know that might sound harsh. No. Yeah. No, I think that's honest. And I think that, um, you know, like a lot of us don't, we have pride, right? And, and, and we don't even want to put ourselves in a position where we're afraid or say that we're afraid or own mm. and be honest that we're afraid. And it's not, even a, it, it's not even really a fear. Like when you hear that, you think, the first time I ever heard that, I thought, afraid. Well, I'm not like afraid. I mean, mm. we don't have like fire. Like it's a negative. We we, right. We don't have fire and brimstone coming down. I mean, this isn't Sodom and Gomorrah. Like we're not seeing cities destroyed that are, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're not seeing that day in and day out, but it's more of a, I mean, really, I think, I think a lot of the time it comes down to teaching, and I loved that you talked about it tonight, because a lot of the time it's not, you don't hear it taught about in church, and it's really, it's not so much a fear, but a reverence, and really mm -hmm. just understanding and have, having that reverence for the Lord. So, um, I, think, I, I think it's missed a lot of the time by, by, by a lot of us, yeah. myself included. And I'll come off your... Uh you're being taught because I uh, likewise not knowing what the fear of the Lord meant. Um, there was a passage that jumped out at me um, in Proverbs where it actually directly answers the question. And it says in Proverbs two, one through five, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. 
Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. What are they looking for? They're looking for the commands. They're looking for the guidance, looking for the insights. We have the word of God. Verse five says, then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain the knowledge of God. So again, coming back to this daily Bible reading, Isaiah says that the word of God doesn't return void. Mm. So even in our dry times when we're ingesting mm-hmm. stuff, we're like, I don't even know what this is. I don't know what this is for. <laughs> um, I, don't, I can't pronounce half these names. And that doesn't go void. God's word returns back to him with fruit. And this also underlines the fact that that word of God that you're ingesting teaches you the fear of God. So if you don't know, mm-hmm. bury yourself in the Word, yeah. and we get it. Yeah. I heard somebody put it this way once, and I, I love this idea. It's practicing the presence of God. And, you know, it's just the idea of just thinking about, trying to think about constantly, God's with me right now. Mm-hmm. You know, God's in this car with me. God's in this room right now as this conversation is going on. God's, God's here in my living room and what's going on the television, you know, he's practicing the presence of God. I think that um, that was one of the things that was so strong in Joseph's life, and, and he was a man who walked in the fear of God as he practiced the presence of God. But the flip side of that was we talked about how um, the, the flip side of walking in the fear of God is walking in the fear of man, and the fear of man is a snare. And, I, and it seems to me, and I just want to get your guys' thoughts, but I, it seems to me that that is a kind of a natural thing that, that guys can struggle with, is walking in the fear of man. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You think that's a... Yeah, that's a big one. And I think that's something that you know, we struggle with day in and day out. I mean, you just talk about the phrase keeping up with the Joneses. I mean, that's a huge snare. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're, if you're striving to achieve things that aren't, aren't actually life-giving, I mean, you're just trying to gather material items and, and, and create a you know, financial situation for yourself that what's that doing for the kingdom? I mean, if you're blessed within a situation like that, that's one thing, and if you're utilizing that, that's another thing. But like, I think um, as far as being a snare, you know. So and- you're you're talking about kind of that f- drive for status to be seen yeah. by others. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think that's an issue. Jamie, you this is your second go around, maybe third, um, working in construction field, yeah. and construction. No offense to you, any of you guys that work in construction, but. You know, I hear all the time that that's a gnarly field to be in and a tough field to be a Christian in. Is is there a lot of pressure for Christian guys to conform in that environment? You know, Being one of the boys. I'm sure. I'm sure that there is. I, I I actually don't think it's any harder per se than maybe somebody who works in a factory. You know, you're surrounded by guys, and guys will be guys is what they say. But, um, you know, when I hear that term, the fear of the Lord, it doesn't initially strike me as being afraid to be, you know, somebody who walks, um, you know, as, as, a, as a Jesus follower and representing him in, in, in that witness. I know that's a part of it. But I really th- actually think that, you know, the fear of man is... is being under this natural fear of man that I'm, I'm going to uh, concern myself, focus on, you know, these elements of everyday life, like paying the bills. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm going to give myself over to that fear and anxiety, which is the fear of man, yeah. you know? I think, you know, before I was walking with Jesus, I, I was under that. And then when, you know, we give our lives to the Lord, you know, and we live to honor him, then we're walking a, under and in the, you know, the sphere of God, like, like uh, Noah displayed. And it doesn't mean that the fear of man disappears. It's still a part of our lives. We mm-hmm. wrestle with it daily, don't we? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's so easy to do, so much easier for me to do than, it, than I feel like, um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But yeah, it's, it's something I absolutely wrestle with. 
I could say probably on a regular basis, the fear of man hmm. and those things that are around me that, that vie for my focus and attention, and yet the Lord's telling me, come, yeah. you know, yeah. I'll give you rest. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Um, Sean, any thoughts you want to add to that about just guys yeah. struggling with that walking in the fear of man? I mean, it's natural, right? We grow up in this physical world with friends groups, parents, these fleshly uh, human agents that we're learning to interact with, with uh, negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement, our whole shaping of our social behavior has to do with these interactions. So it's very natural to come from a position where I care status because that comes with reward. I care um, that I'm friendly. I care because I've learned that this is the behavior I need. So free, fear of man, I think, is the most natural thing we start with. It's the fear of God that overcomes that through mm -hmm. our progression, through our sanctification process, that begins to take that natural narrative and switch it. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can snap into it. I think it's God teaching you over your life to fear him. It's good. Appreciate that, you guys. Um, <clears throat> I want to move to the, because we're kind of running out of time here, last thing, and that's, you know, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And, and so I want to talk about being a witness in, in the workplace, because all three of you guys work in a secular environment. So for, first question I have, and, and maybe, you know, if you all want, want to answer this, you can, but how important um, is your witness or your conduct, I'll use that word, your conduct, to the credibility of your words? Um, I think it's immensely important. Mm -hmm. Our conduct speaks f for who we are. If, it, it, you know, if we're believers, if we're Christians and we're not acting like Christians, then w what is that? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you growing up, I mean, I saw Christians behaving all kinds of ways, and I'm just like, what is it? what's in that for me? I just, they act just like I do, you know? Um, and I, I lived as a Christian going off and acting like everyone else was in the world. Um, so the, the way I am today is vastly different to who I was before. Um, you know, I am very careful in the way that I speak. I don't drink. I don't, you know, I like, I can be involved in conversations with a bunch of the guys and we go, you know, and I can have conversations without going there, mm -hmm. if you guys know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and they know that I don't talk like them. They know that I don't drink like them. They know that I don't do the same things that they do. Um, and I think that's where it really begins, and that's where they really start to see that difference, and it gives you the opportunity. I mean, a lot of the time they're like, you know, especially if someone new comes on that doesn't like know me very well, and they're like, why aren't you drinking, or why aren't you doing this, or I notice you don't talk, you know, you don't, you're not dropping F-bombs, <laughs> or whatever the case may be. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it gives me, like, it'll, it'll open the door and give me that opportunity, and it's not, I'm not like an evangelist. I'm not gonna go out there and like, you know, do that. It's just not, I've never, been like that, but I think if my walk speaks for who I am, I mean, I think, you know, that's your character, right? Like, your character is who you are when no one's looking, and yeah. when you're in the workplace surrounded by a bunch of non-believers, it's the same thing. That's your character, and you need to stand true on who that is and who, who you are in the Lord. You know, I listen to some people talk today, and I, and I just feel like they don't even know how to talk anymore. I mean, we were, we were down at the beach the other day uh, with our grandkids, and these junior high kids are just dropping F-bombs every other word. I'm, I like, I'm like, great walk over and I'm like, who taught you guys how to talk? I mean, it's just sort of ridiculous. W what about when we talk about conduct, your worth at work ethic? What, what role does that play in, in people being willing to hear you guys? What do you think, Sean? Oh, I'm like the worst person to ask on this one. So, um, Is that because your work ethic stinks? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I will say transformation-wise, it did. Okay. And um, I, I love where God puts me 
and sometimes I don't call it where God puts me, but it's more of a, the challenges I get faced with. And I, I, I tell sometimes people when I'm describing what I do and they, their eyes roll back and I'm like, you know what? It's the place I get to fight dragons every day. <laughs> it, it's, the, it's where I get my challenge and I get to charge in whole, whole, uh, full charge and do good and solve things, fix things. But then what happens is because I'm, I'm holding myself to this accountability of like, oh, I, I missed that up, I, I missed this. But then when you stop and you ask, you know, well, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? And you realize, oh my goodness, I'm, I am like, <laughs> I was going to say head and shoulders above, uh, <laughs> six, eight, I'm always head and shoulders. Above people. Um, but like that performance, that drive, it's, it's, it's like, it's an outpouring of the blessing God poured into me as a person who naturally doesn't have that, but he put me in a situation where leaning in is successful. It is, it is a, uh, a work ethic that comes from the joy of the job. Hmm. And, so, and it does stand out because a lot of people go, man, how did you get all that done? I'm like, I don't know. How did you not get all that done? Yeah. Yeah. So... I don't know if that's helpful, but that's just me. That's me. Uh, lastly, I think um, relationship is is so key because, as you mentioned before, coming up to a stranger and and uh, yeah. you know trying to introduce them to you know to Jesus is is quite hard. Not that it's impossible, of course not, but um, I think that it's really cool to watch the fruit of a relationship that you can build with somebody in the workplace that you see sometimes more than and hang out with more than sometimes your own family. And uh, there's a lot of humility in that, but I, I, the payoff is, it's amazing, you know, to, uh, to be a, a, a humble servant to these people around you. And, uh, and whether they question that like you said, and say, why are you so happy or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, I trust that the Lord is, is just using that, you know, and, um, and, and I just have, have seen time and time again, the Lord eventually opened the door. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's not something that I'm, I'm trying to force, but it's beautiful when it happens because then you can have a very real conversation that you haven't tried to force at all. It's usually coming at a, as, as a question they want at that point Mm -hmm. to hear more. They want to hear your take on what's going on in their life. They, and, and it's just a, you're just feeding the hungry at that point. And it's pretty, pretty amazing to watch them, um, you know, respond and the Lord move. And so that's why I think relationship is so key, you know, in that area of witnessing at work. It's good. And, um, you know, I love what Pastor Steve always says. Uh, he says, you know, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and sometimes, you know, it's just learning to, to listen to people. And, and, you know, when they're moaning and groaning about something going on in their home life, and instead of, you know, just ignoring it, you're, you're zeroing in. And, and, and I would even encourage... Um, you know, you guys, as you're maybe getting to know somebody and they're in that situation, um, to say, hey, can I pray for you? And, uh, you know, and just and, and pray for them or, or let them know if, it, if that's maybe uncomfortable to say, um, you know, I'm going to be praying for you. And, uh, and then when you see them next time, just say, I've been praying for you. How, how's, how's that going? And, you know, I, I'm doing this more. Sometimes I'll, I'll run into people, like, in the store, and they'll be like, um, you know, oh, hey, Pastor Rob. And they start going into something's going on, and I'll be like, let's pray. Like, right now, on aisle six, in the grocery store, you know? And, uh, and not feeling weird about that. It's like, you know, God's here, and, you know, and he's into it, and let's do this. And, and, uh, but I'll tell you this, and I've had this happen a few times, and it just grieves my heart so much as it, talking about that work ethic thing, because that is so important, guys, so important. That is so key to your witness. And sometimes I'll meet somebody that's not a Christian, and, and they'll say, hey, what do you do? And I'll tell them, and, and I'll say, hi, Pastor, you know, Calvary Vista, and and, and I've had guys say this to me, oh, I had somebody that worked for me uh, that went to your church, and 
They were the worst employee because all they wanted to do was talk about Jesus and they didn't do their job. And oh, I just like, I'm just like, we, we did not teach them that. You know, we, <laughs> that's not what we teach them, you know, but it's like breaks my heart. And so I, I think what you guys are saying is really, really key that, you know, your work ethic and all of that, it, it adds to the credibility of people wanting to hear you that, you know, hey, Okay, this, this guy, I mean, I believe that a Christian should be the best employee in any company. Then you know why? Because you're not working for a paycheck, you're working for God. And so you should be, maybe, maybe I'll put it this way, not the best. You might not be the most talented, but you should be the hardest working because you're working for God. Um, before we wrap up, any, anybody else have a question for any of these guys? Um, Something that you're wondering about or thinking about or can I make a comment? Sure can. I think when it comes to fearing the Lord, yeah. The day that I reached out or actually Vern reached out. Hey, hey Vern, come up here for a minute so everybody can hear you. <laughs> I can speak louder. <laughs> That's all right. Use the mic. He's got a great voice. He does. <laughs> We give him a mic, he start, might start preaching, though. We might be here till 9 o'clock. Uh, he's a former pastor here, so. Uh, I was just saying that when I came to know the Lord as my personal Savior, uh, I'll never forget how my sweetheart, who became my wife, turned to the Scriptures and asked if I would read those Scriptures and it was Matthew's account of the crucifixion of Jesus. Mm. And all of a sudden it hit me that I deserved hell. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I deserved hell. We deserve hell. And that's what struck the fear of God in me, mm, the right kind good. of fear. Yeah, it's good. Recognizing who he is, recognizing his power, his authority, his sovereignty. And when that hit me, it just it just stripped self. It stripped everything that I was to recognize that I deserved hell, and yet here was Jesus who died for me, and I was convinced at that moment that if I'd have been the only person on the face of the earth that he would have died for me. Mm. And when I recognized that, how, how could you not mm -hmm. for the rest of your life? So serve good. Him? How could you not? Amen. With such grace and mercy and power that he gives us, it's just amazing that a kid who stuttered all my life became a preacher and a teacher. Mm. And, and uh, I'll start <laughs> hey, hold on real quick. Hey, I'm going to have, Vern, will you pray over all of the men? Why don't you, each of you guys, grab the shoulder of a guy next to you, and uh, will you pray for us, Vern, just to be these men of faith that walk in the fear of God? Hmm. Lord God, it is so awesome to understand that when we see who you are, when we recognize who we are, and then we can say by faith, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Lord, I pray that you'll just saturate us with that as men of God, that it is you and you alone that are able to live the Christian life. And so I'm asking you, Lord, by your mercy and grace upon each of these precious brothers each of these guys, Lord, Lord, each one is going through, I know this in my heart, each one of them is going through something right now, mm -hmm. every single one in their own way. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to bless us with the reality that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, and that when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. So Lord, bless these men. Lord, thank you for Pastor Rob, Lord, continue to give him guidance and wisdom, and direction. All these pastors here, Lord. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, 
for Jamie, who has his arm around me, Lord, mm -hmm. because I sense that this is what men of God are in this place. Mm -hmm. Lord, thank you that you love us, that you see us in Christ tonight. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right.